Hi, this is Roger Moore, and you're listening to James Bond Radio. Hello and welcome to James Bond Radio. My name is Tom Sears and this week we have another bit of Timothy flavor action for you. We have a guest interview courtesy of our other man in LA, the other other fella, Matthew Chernoff. Now he has managed to score an interview with one Grand L. Bush, who you will of course remember as Hawkins in License to Kill. Now next week, Chris and I will be returning as usual. We're going to be doing a little report on our trip to Peace Gloria last month. And we're going to have a little bit of a a kind of a catch up on the Bond 25 situation. What's been going on? What are our thoughts? What are our hopes? What are our fears? So you can look out for that next week. Until then, I give you, courtesy of Matthew Chernoff over there in LA, Mr. Grand L. Bush. Who are you? My name's Bond. James Bond. Bond. James. Bond, what do you think you're doing? Hi, I'm Matthew Chernoff, and today I'd like to welcome our special guest to James Bond Radio. He's one of the stars of License to Kill. You know him as Hawkins. I'm speaking, of course, about Mr. Grand L. Bush. Welcome, Grand. Thank you, Matthew, and I would like to say thank you to your listening audience as well. How are you today, by the way? Oh, it's a beautiful day in Los Angeles, and um, it's, it's wonderful to be above ground. And yourself? Oh, very, very well, especially because I'm talking to you. Um, you know, in prep for this discussion, looking at your filmography, uh, which I had followed for years, it just reads like a list of the best movies from the 80s and 90s, just one mm-hmm. after another from Die Hard to Demolition Man to the Hollywood Shuffle, groundbreaking movies like that, groundbreaking movies like Colors. It's just an amazing body of work you've amassed. Uh, you know, it's it's astonishing. Yes, I've been blessed to work with a number of people that I um, admired their work, whether they were directors or actors or screenwriters. And um, I uh, thank God for all my opportunities. And they they came uh, at times in my life where I really needed that, and I just kind of my energy just would draw toward me, and I, I was very happy and blessed to once again to be working with such an illustrious group of artisans. So thank you very much for that. So before we talk about License to Kill and your role as Hawkins, I'm curious just to hear a little bit about your overall connection with James Bond in general. Were you a, a Bond fan before you were cast as Hawkins? <laughs> That's a very good question. I, I have to preface that by saying uh, I was a, a Disney child, probably way back in the day, and I was raised on Disney films. A uh, little bit of trivia. Um, I watched things like uh, all the animation films from Disney, and then the old Yeller films, and so that was my my world as far as film and television. Then, when my thirteenth year, my father in Cincinnati, Ohio, we were visiting his relatives. He took me to see a film called Life. Since, no, 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 not license. That was on Her Majesty's Secret Service with George Lazenby, 1969. So uh, here I was at 13, never having seen Sean Connery or anybody. So George Lazenby was my first James Bond. Wow. And I went into the theater and I sat there. And, and this is my introduction as well to some of the the magical things that John Glenn, the second unit uh, um, director, had worked on. And it was just absolutely amazing. The storylines, all of a sudden I was thrust into an adult world. The storylines, the the stunts, the uh, script. I really sat there and I was glued and I was 
drawn into every facet of that film. So that was my James Bond experience. And I knew nothing of Sean Connery, so George Lazenby was James Bond for me. So uh, thereafter, I began to appreciate all the other ones. But the amazing thing, as I look back on my life, that was 1969. And 20 years later, in 1989, I'm sitting here with Covey Broccoli, um, John Glenn, and my James Bond, Timothy Dalton. And never would I have imagined in my entire life that that was going to be my future. Wow, that's that's an amazing story to jump 20 years and now you're the guy. Wow, mm -hmm. something else. Yeah, that was uh, quite amazing. Um, and the experience of, of meeting Cubby and um, as we all know, Albert Buckley and John Glenn, uh, these, these Brits, I have to tell you, um, Barbara Broccoli as well. They are an amazing group of people to work for and with. I um, never in my life, and, and I'm not going overboard here, met a group of production um, professionals in, in, in the whole scheme of how they put their production together how they greet their people, how they treat their people. It is an illustrious experience, fascinating, stunning, and extraordinary all at once. I, I really, really relish the experience. And um, for anybody that gets the opportunity to do a film, do not turn it down. James Bond people are fantastic to work with and for. Now, um, you had been acting for well over a decade before you were cast in License to Kill. I mean, you, you've been uh, turning out performance after performance in great movies. So how did this particular role come about? Very good. Um, I like that. That was uh, very, it's very interesting. Um, probably after Joel Silver, Cubby was the first person that I sat down with. My agents called me up and they said, you're going to read for Albert Broccoli for a James Bond film. And I almost fell over. Um, I said, okay, let's do this. <laughs> and I went to UA, went to UA out at um, MGM Studios in Los Angeles to meet with them. And I just sat there with Cubby Broccoli, and John Glenn wasn't there at the time. And we sat, and we talked. And I try to stay in calm when I talk with these people. I sit down, I meet them for the very first time. Cubby Broccoli, Sidney Poitier, Dennis Hopper, it goes on and on and on. So you try to maintain and just go in and say, these are artists like myself. And he was so understated. He was very calm, very nice, very friendly man. And we got on famously. And that was it. I didn't read for anything. He didn't tell me what I was doing. That was it. Well, so so I was, go home. There was no audition process. It was just a personal meeting with Cubby and kind of feeling you out? Yes, entirely. And I go home. My agent called me and said, you got the job. Wow. And that, <laughs> that like um, Die Hard, was one of the few times that, you know, someone called me and said, I like you, we sit, we talk, and I don't want to, you know, try to steer the direction of things. I just enjoy the meeting. And then get called and said, you have the job. So it was wonderful, and therefore, and moving forward, we started working. Robert Davi and I had worked on Die Hard together. So he called me, and he said, Grant, I found out you were going to be in Life is Secure with me. <laughs> and I said, yeah, we're going to do this, all right. 
And so we had a great chat on the phone. And when we got to uh, Key West, and I got to meet everyone there, um, the second unit directors, the first ADs, um, John Glenn, of course, and Robert Davi, who was, he was magnificent in this film. Um, I have to tell you, so I don't know if you guys know, uh, Robert Davi is a bit of a practical joker. Really? Um, you wouldn't, yeah, he's notorious. You would not think that. But it was very interesting because he and Benicio del Toro and the rest of those gentlemen that played his crew in the film, they were baddies, they all hung out together. And I guess that was his way of bonding with his people. And he would do the most mis mischievous things to me, he and Benicio. They would um, call me up and say, um, Barbara Broccoli is sending over uh, pizzas or lunch for everybody, and room service will be up with your meal shortly. I'm sitting in my, my hotel room setting. Next thing I know, I get a call that says, we're coming up and a knock at the door minutes afterward. I go to open the door, I can't open my door. And I pull and I pull and I yank, I go, what's going on? I can't open my door. And then I hear this laughing, and finally, the door just kind of flies open when I pull it hard. Robert Davi and Benicio had tied my doorknob to the railing outside. Oh, jeez. <laughs> they just, they're just, they're crazy people. He would go to the production office and, you know, we get sides, which are revisions of your script every day. After you have the white pages, then they move into the other colors to keep you abreast of changes that are being made that will reflect maybe your performance or give you new information about what your character is doing. He and the two of them, they'd go to the production office and write complete sides on, on another colored pages, <laughs> slide them under my door. And I'd be sitting there going, oh, I have new sides. And I'd start reading and it would say Hawkins moves in closely to Sanchez, his <laughs> eyes piercing, looking deep into them with rage, and then slowly his hand reaches out and caresses his cheek with love. <laughs> and I'm like, what the hell is this? And you know, I get a call, and they're laughing at the other end of the phone. And I say, okay, I've been had again. So we, we all had a very good time. It sounds like a great stuff. crew to work with. Yeah, they, they were fabulous. And, and Timothy, he was, he was beyond words. I was, uh, you know, I saw the living daylights because I wanted to be ready for, for this gentleman for whom I was working with. And uh, I was like, hmm, this is different. Uh, and I enjoyed him. I watched him. You know, I, I'd seen some of his other films working with Catherine Hepburn, The Lion in Winter, when he was very young, with Sir Anthony Hopkins. And uh, so I knew a bit of his career. But I have to tell you honestly, by the time he hit License to Kill, he had evolved. He knew what he wanted to really do with this character. And I think, personally, he left his stamp. And uh, I really wish he had done a third one. Oh, you and because me I both, yeah. He set, yeah. I, I thought he set the groundwork for Daniel Craig. And his seriousness, you know, he took that genre and, and, and just grounded it in a way it made it, all right, we're back to realism. And I really enjoyed that. And, and, and it's been perpetuated since. And I, I really, really enjoyed him. For me, he's my favorite Bond. Uh, I think you have good taste there. He's, he's one of the best there is. He's so intense. His intensity is just really powerful. 
Yes, he is. He's a very studied, and he puts his character and knowledge together in such a way that he knows his character inside and out, the direction he wants to take the, the not only the script, the story, but his particular people. Um, when, when Timothy was working with all the other actors, he knew how and when he wanted to shift the, um, the movement of the scene, how he worked in it. He's a very giving actor. John Glenn allows you as an actor to also, he wants to see what you're going to do. There are, they give you a lot of latitude. And then either one of them come in. He, um, some actors like to try to direct other actors. Timothy watches what you're going to do, and then he sees how he can work it. And therefore, you can start to bounce off each other without giving each other direction. You know, in acting, you always want to be in the moment. If you're watching and listening to the other character, the other actor, then you can. And he gives you things, if you're watching and listening, to work with. And John Glenn... He gives you room to to experiment, and then he comes in like a surgeon and says, "This is good. I like this already. Pull back right here, and that's it." And and they got this down. They have it down. So, license Wonderful to kill. Um, when you're talking about that level of seriousness that Dalton brought to the role, it's license to kill really is kind of a different kind of bond film than audiences were used to at the time. It's much darker and grittier. Um, were you aware that this was a new type of bond when you were making it? Um, not at this point, not to this level, because I had already seen the living daylight. Right. And I was like, hmm, hmm. Okay, and he, even though I've seen all the other ones in between up to that point, George Lazenby was still my last. You know, there was uh, Sir Roger Moore. And then I started seeing some of the other Sean Connery films. Mm-hmm. But I still had this guy. Is He was the quintessential James Bond. Then Timothy comes along. And I watched that movie and I was like, mm, okay. I like, you know, it's good. It's good. But he had not evolved to the bond that he was going to be until uh, License to Kill. And that was like, when I sat there and I watched that film, because we, the, we premiered at the Prince's Trust, and I watched everything come together. The pacing, his grittiness, where he had taken this role, I was like, okay, we are in a different era. Let's go with this. I like this. And then I was ready to see what he was going to do for number three. So, um, yeah, it's uh, he's an intense actor. And he's been a very good uh, friend through the years. We've kept in touch. Now, you'd already played several law enforcement roles before License to Kill. So when you get the script for this, how do you approach playing Hawkins to like make it interesting for yourself? Was there something in that script that you latched on to to build that character? Well, I've had friends in law enforcement. And I would ask them questions. Did not know too much about DEA. So everything I had to gather from DEA, I had to read about. Um, And that pretty much was about the extent of that. Um, I I wanted to really like, sometimes you like to do ride-alongs or work with people that are... um, in a darker area of law enforcement. But um, I could not, and so I was kind of limited to my accesses. I could find literature and I could do research, but that was about it. 
And uh, you'd mentioned uh, Dalton and Davi. One of your other co-stars in the film is David Hedison, who's many of us feel is the quintessential Felix Leiter. Uh, what can you tell me about working with him? David Hedison. David is very nice. He's very funny. Uh, he's very jovial, easygoing, um, and and he's all about the work. Um, my scenes with him were, were very light, so it was his wedding, and we um, we all were running about, and it was very physical. It was the opening scene, so everything was very hectic, even though it was not. But we did not have a chance a lot to be. How can you say this? Um, yeah, how can you say this? He's very easy to get along with. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've seen his work as we all have. And this was, I think he's played Felix Leiter a couple of times. He has, yeah. So he was, yeah, yeah. He, he, he was familiar with the ropes. He'd been to the rodeo before. So he was very easy. And the, the one thing that was interesting in all of that opening for me, I have to tell you another piece of trivia, was Rafer Johnson. Oh, yeah. Here's this man. Oh, good Lord. Here's this man. He's, uh, you know, an Olympic icon. And uh, we're talking. I'm standing next to him. I'm sizing him up. My goodness. It's Rafer Johnson. So um, we have this scene that uh, John Glenn is setting up and we're to run to the helicopters down there where uh, Timothy Dalton and David Hedison are. And the second unit gentleman was explaining the setup and the shot. And he said, on action, I want you to take off at full speed. And it's about 100 meters to the helicopter. And I, uh, okay, we're both talking. I turned to Rafer to say something, and the second unit gentleman is pulling back. And just as we started our conversation, he screams action. So I took <laughs> off. I stopped my conversation. I took off full tilt. And I'm running full tilt with all this gear on at 100 miles an hour. And probably like 25, 30 yards into it, I'm like, oh, I am out running Rayford Johnson, you know? <laughs> and uh, about 60 yards into it, all of a sudden, this gust of wind hit me from behind, and this thing blew past me. <laughs> and I was like, okay, he still got the legs. He uh, just, uh, it was like I was standing still. That's hilarious. So, uh, yeah, I couldn't get him in. He must have been 50 years old at that point. He looks amazing in that yeah. film. The two of you together, standing there with your machine guns and your uh, DEA outfits on, running in slow motion towards the camera in that classic shot, it's it's a wonderful image. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Those, those are memorable things, you know. They're, they're things you tell stories about to your children, to your friends. They're wonderful moments and opportunities. Love to hear there was another actor on the set that was in a, a, a couple of the scenes with you that I, is always one of my favorites, uh, Frank McRae. He plays Sharky in the film, and I've loved his performances mm -hmm. in Steven Spielberg's 1941 and Robert Zemeckis' Used mm -hmm. Cars. Did you know Frank mm -hmm. outside the cast? No, no, I, I did not have the, uh, the joy of, of knowing him outside uh, the cast prior to or, or even after. We all, and sometimes on the film, you meet people and you get a chance to enjoy them and um, you don't ever see them again. And that's that. Um, so I really enjoy watching him. I enjoyed watching his performance. Every once in a while, I'll get a chance to see um, License to Kill. And I am amazed at, at everyone's performance, the level of commitment that they gave to their characters 
and through the the entire film. So um, I, I just that was the extent of my relationship with Frank McCray. Mm-hmm. He's an NFLer. Oh yeah, you know there was all these people come together from all these different walks of life, and you know they find themselves in the film, television industry as, as artists, and they have another side to them. And um, I, I enjoy that. When people experience different facets of their humanity and their, what, what they have inside themselves. Yeah. Now, over the years, you've worked with some of the best action directors in the business, uh, John McTiernan and all kinds of just masters of their craft. Uh, how would you uh, put John Glenn into that? That mix. He's he seems like one of the the master craftsmen of the of the the field. I think what puts John Glenn head and shoulders above most action adventure directors. I think he, Steven Spielberg. Uh, there are a few others. They stand alone, and they have put their mark on the films that they make because they're masters, not just journeymen, of other um, qualities. They're not just good screenwriters or um, good directors, but they are, they've cut their teeth as second unit people and they've come up through the ranks. They've learned the entire sphere. And that's what I think makes John Glenn and those others um, just their standouts at what they do. Uh, the action sequences in License to Kill were just amazing. Um, from our opening to, um, let me see, oh, the, um, the climax just before we hit the resolution. But Timothy is, is, is running down. He's just relentless going after Robert Dobby. And this, he's just like, this man is annoying in the worst sort of way. And John Glenn is shooting these action scenes like nothing you've ever seen. That, that 18 wheeler on its side coming toward camera, uh, having these stingers shot at it when it hits that dirt ramp and then it, it, it's just coming toward camera on those wheels. And it was just, it's flawless. Timothy, we know it's a stuntman, but he makes the, the, uh, the trailer. Um, what's the first part of the, the eight one two with Is it the trailer? Mm-hmm. You know, the front of the truck. Oh um, yeah, the cab. Do a wheelie. Wow. Yeah, the cab. Thank you, thank you. The cab do a wheelie through that fire and then drop down and keep going. It, it's just some of these stunt scenes are amazing. And when you have that kind of expertise and background, when you're a director from a second unit standpoint, you know how to really grab and hold your audience and, and show them things they've never seen before. And uh, that's what John Glenn has done in his career. He's, he's been able to utilize everything from all his previous experiences and make it pay off in what he's working in currently. Does he work closely with you on performance? and, and or, or is he just leaves that to you because he trusts you from the casting? He... As I was saying earlier, he gives you a lot of latitude. And they start out with, let's see the master shot. And he watches the actors play. And then he starts to say, okay, I want this pulled in here, there. He starts doing his staging. He, just, uh, he does the blocking for the scene. And within the blocking, all of a sudden you have restrictions. Unbeknownst to you, you start changing your performance. So that way, he doesn't infringe on your performance. 
if he has something he wants to say, he starts by giving you the positive critique and then saying, I want you to turn this up or turn this down. Or in blocking, you would be better if we, you came in at this angle or you use this side. So he gives you a lot of latitude and they are very confident for the people that they hire going in. They've seen you. They watch you. They know that you're competent. And you don't get hired unless they believe in you as, as, a, as, a, as an artist. So you, with that in mind, you should go in with confidence. Do your homework. Study. Know your character. Create your character analysis. Know what your character is all about throughout the entire script, which is your Bible in your before and after life. And with that, Sean Glenn will let you go. I wish he still directed. I think, I, I believe that was his last Bond film. It was, it's his favorite Bond film as well that he made. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Covey as well. That was um, his last acting, producing James Bond film. So they both kind of retired from that. You're involved in, in your scenes in License to Kill uh, feature two of the most, I think, iconic locations in the movie. Uh, one is the Seven Mile Bridge between Florida and Key West, where your character lands in that giant helicopter. And then you're also outside that the Hemingway House, the, such a historic location. Can you talk to me about those locations that you worked on? They're really spectacular. Yes. Um, the Hemingway House, that's one of my favorite scenes there. Um, it was in Key West. A lot of people, a lot of people, I don't even think some of those people were extras. I don't think some of them were atmosphere people. Um, they got a way to set that up and um, utilize that entire area and it was my first visit. I'd never been to Key West before. And um, it was very, speaking of the weather, it's, you know, it's very humid. Water's hot all the time. You can't cool off by jumping in the water. And the, uh, so I, I liked it as a location. When you get to um, go to a location you've never been, you do some, you know, walking around and finding the lay of the land. So um, walking up to that gate when I turned Timothy over was, uh, what is this one? I, I, they didn't really give me a, the exact clue about what that particular building was. So in regard to Key West and Florida, it was in quite fantastical place. You have to be careful when you go swimming in the waters, you'll find barracudas. Really? So, yeah, oh yeah. I went out swimming, I mean pretty far. There was a, kind of a raft platform. You could swim out too, it's probably about the yards offshore. Mm -hmm. I dove off of it, went down deep. Just I could see these the biggest fish I'd ever seen was like, that's not a shark, but that's a, something else. And when I came back up, they said, oh, that's barracudas down there. So it's not a place to not be aware of your surroundings. Now, you attended the world premiere of License to Kill in London. I think you mentioned that. Um, what can you tell me about that event? Did the Bond uh, producers really throw a, an enormous premiere? That was the shindig to end all shindigs. <laughs> I, I have to tell you, <laughs> it, it, it's absolutely marvelous. Yeah, um, it's a spectacle. Um, the, the, the magistry of it all was amazing. Um, the Prince's Trust in and of itself, I think is, is a wonderful thing. You know, there's um, young people that need help that are downtrodden, that have aged out of a particular situation as in America. 
um, and they still need help. And and they pull together in England, and they have these charities that raise lots of money to help disenfranchised people. And we should always take care of each other. We have to look out for ourselves. It is our duty in, in humanity to take care of our own. And I'm glad that, that I was a part of that. I was able to, they gave us the protocol to meet Prince Charles. Wow. Which is his trust and Princess Diana. So it all lined up at a certain point. And Charles, Prince Charles and Princess Diana came out. We bowed when he came to each and every one of us. He is, uh, he is suave. He is smooth. He is elegant in his behavior. Um, Prince Charles is, is not, not what I thought he would be. I thought he would be stiff and upper lip. And he is it's extraordinary in his, um, how can you say, graciousness to a meeting people. Wow. And Princess Diana at the time, she was very kind, quite polite, and um, I wouldn't say shy, but, but she was demure, that's mm-hmm. the word. She was demure in her behavior toward us all. And uh, here I was, once again, doing something I will never, ever do again in life, <laughs> me royalty. You know? Oh, wow. And, uh, and that, was, that was, I cannot explain to you how stupendous it, this, this thrilling this was. It was really all inspiring. And then afterwards, we go to see the film. They picked us up after from there. I was in a vintage Rolls Royce, big white vintage Rolls Royce. Go see the film. Then they pick us up again and take us off to a castle. And, and I have to admit, the Brits, they kick off their shoes and they partied like it was 1999. <laughs> it was shindig man it was really a shindig i enjoyed it i um you know you you get these moments and things in your life that you never thought you'd experience and then you go wow this is this is what this has made life worth living and i get a chance to share these stories with master that's wonderful. Uh, well, you have so many fans out there. I'm assuming that you must get recognized constantly by people who've seen you on screen over the years. Um, probably from Die Hard, because that's, I mean, nobody can ever forget your pairing with Robert Davi. It just steals the movie. Um, but what about License to Kill? Do you get approached by fans of the Bond franchise? Constantly. Constantly. As a matter of fact, um, the last time I pressed the flesh with John Glenn mm-hmm. was at Autographica 18. That was in Birmingham, England. It was uh, year 2012. It was, it was, it was, I have to tell you, it was a joyous reunion of uh, legendary cast members. Uh, we were celebrating James Bond's franchise's uh, 50th, 50th anniversary. Oh, I remember. Uh, yeah, yeah. This uh, this commemorated um, a first for for many of the James Bond alumni. And to me personally, I got a chance to fellowship with some of the James Bond girls from Moonraker and a lot of the other films. But the fans are. Absolutely amazing. They are from all walks of life, all nations throughout Europe, uh, um, Eastern Europe, and as far as Asia. And to see these people line up that you would have no idea that they know who you are. But then you have to remember you're in a James Bond fan. These people are loyal to this franchise. 
and they love each and every one that comes out. And if you are new to the franchise and you are an actor in it, you know, um, I guess if you're a singer or whatever else you may have done to participate in the film, they are enamored and really let you know they appreciate what you've done, what your worth was toward this film. So I met people from all over the world at that um, signing that knew me, not just from that, not just from the James Bond film, but from all my other work. And I was really honored that um, they reached out to my, my wife and they wanted, the people of Autographica, wanted me to participate. She arranged all of that and had me come over and participate in something that, uh, another thing, that it's just, it's just another experience that uh, I've been to Comic-Con, mm -hmm. done that. And that's, that's an animal all into itself. But these are people that just, it's just for James Bond. And it was nice to see John Glenn there again. I bet. And talk with him. And all the Bond girls, and, and we're all kind of in awe of each other. We're all looking around and going, oh my God, that's blah, 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 blah. <laughs> You know, <laughs> it's funny when you're an actor and then you become a fan of somebody else, all of a sudden you relegate yourself to, okay, I, I'm just a fan. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm not me anymore. I'm a fan now. So. It's, it's a wonderful experience. Sometimes it's a, it's a wonderful life. Sometimes it's a very wonderful life. It sounds it. So before we wrap up, um, I want to mention two legendary movie stars that you've worked with in the past uh, and have you tell me if you can something that comes to your mind when I say their name. Uh, the first is Sylvester Stallone. I have to tell you, when I think of Sylvester Stallone, I think of this man as a screenwriter with vast imagination. I love his work as a screenwriter. He puts stories together and then he acts in them. The acting part for actors, we act. That's what we do. But when you find an actor that can create a story that knocks you back in your seat and he has written this, that's what impresses me. So that's what I have to say about Sylvester Stallone when I see him. We recently saw Creed II and it was like, he still, he still, he still has it. He can sit down and put together a story, and he uses every facet of the other stories. And, you know, he. I think he's amazing. He's an actor to come up with all these, these different types of stories. I, I have to applaud him. That's interesting that you single the that. other one? Um, the other one would be um, Dennis Hopper. Oh. That's my boy. <laughs> Dennis Hopper. We became friends. And I miss him. I miss him very much. He, um, Trinidad Silva and I were like the veteranos, if you were, on colors. So we get into conversations about styles and genre and realism versus naturalism. And Dennis would be right in there with us. And these young bucks, and some of these people were even gang members, they'd look at us and go, what the hell are they talking about? And Dennis loved that type of conversation because, you know, He's from that era where you, you learn about theater. You learn about the origin of theater, the history of theater. And, and then that comes into 
that's the basis of all of it. Of television, film, there was theater first. And we would have those conversations. When the film was over, Dennis would seek me out and uh, we would go to things, um, events. He'd call my agency and say, I want you to do a little role for me with Jody Foster. And I'd do that. And then he'd be doing something with Morgan Creek. And he'd, he'd call me up and he'd say, Grant, are you busy? And I'd say, no, so I'm doing something. I'd say, I'm beta. And I'd go over his home in Venice Beach. And uh, he pointed to, you know, he was an artist. Oh, yeah. My wife and I, we went to uh, Amsterdam. And while we were there, we went to, went to a museum to see Dennis had a showing there. And we went to see his work. Mm-hmm. So at his house, he had a lot of his art up in his place. And he pulled me over. He said, look at that right there. What do you see? And I looked at this etching. It was done with an scripto knife. It was a negative. And it was a negative that was pulled from a frame in the film. From a film. I don't know what the I'm looking and I'm looking. And he says, Grand, that's from colors. And I said, okay. He said, look a little harder. And I'm looking. I said, okay. He said, that's you. Really? Wow. He pulled the frame from colors and did a little kind of abstract avant-garde etching around my face. Wow. From a, yeah. And I was like in awe. I was awestruck. What an honor. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I didn't even know how to react when he said, it's you. And I was like, ah, ah. <laughs> and then he turned and he walked away. <laughs> you know, you're looking at it. This man has some artwork that he's done of me. In his home, I am humble beyond belief. That's a beautiful story. He's really, uh, he was quite, a, quite a, a renaissance man in so many ways. Yes, I miss him to this day. So to wrap up, as I said at the beginning of the interview, you've amassed this incredible filmography um, in both film and television. So looking back on License to Kill, what's your favorite overall memory of working on that? Hmm. I would have to say the nights when I wasn't working and Barbara Broccoli and Timothy Dalton and some of the above the line people, Barbara Broccoli would, would call um, my my hotel room and say, Grant, are you busy? Would you like to go out to dinner? Here we are in Mexico City. And it's a, it's a very magical place. You know, you have people breathing fire as you're driving by. It's just glorious. And she would call me on different occasions and say, Grant, come on, let's go to dinner. And I, I reflect back to when I was telling you earlier, such a classy group of people that just make you part of a family and make you feel that you are now are part of this organization, which is the biggest family you'll ever have. And I would go to dinner with them. Um, I've studied Spanish, so I can, I can make my way around 
in Spanish, I'm semi-fluent. I can read, I can understand, I can speak and get what I need and ask questions. So they would rely on me. Okay, Grant, tell them this, tell them that. So, <laughs> so I was like, okay, this is what I'm here for. So I'm going to do my best. And we had fantastic time. And that above everything made it such a glorious and magical experience. These people made you part of their family. So they do it right from the ground up. They make you give your all because they give all to you. Wow. That sounds very special. Yeah. Matthew, if you ever have an opportunity to work with these people, you grab it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you, you know I will. Uh, Grand, thank you so much for taking some time to talk with me today about License to Kill. Your performance in it really is a, such a, a wonderful part of that movie, and your work over the years has just brought so much joy to my life, and uh, uh, I just really appreciate that. It has been my pleasure. And I want you and your listeners to have a wonderful, beautiful, and uh, marvelous day. And um, hopefully we'll get a chance to, you know, talk about things in the future, uh, great things in both of our lives. You got it. So, thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Grant. Take care. You too now. Bye-bye. <laughs>